in a world surrounded by darkness, there is a voice that whispers to every young heart, urging them to find the treasure of truth. Those who follow the path will discover eternal riches beyond their wildest dreams. Join us now for an amazing adventure, a journey for life with Jesus. Good evening, friends. Welcome again to our final program in the Amazing Adventure series. We are so glad that you joined us wherever you might be, at a church, at a home, or maybe at a school. We trust that this series has been a blessing to you. It's with sadness that we come to the final in this series, but it's not the end of our study of God's Word. As we have mentioned several times, we have a website, amazingfactskids.org. And for those of you who are watching, if you've missed one of the previous programs, you can go to the amazingfactskids.org website and you can see previous programs. In addition to the programs on the website, we also have a number of studies that children can take in conjunction with this program. We've been talking about the new study guides that have been developed tonight. We're talking about a kingdom of gold. You can learn more at the website about these study guides. Check back with us at that website on a regular basis for further study in God's Word. Well, at this time, let's stand as we sing our theme song once more, Life is an Adventure. Please remain standing. I'm going to invite our volunteers to come forward for the scripture reading and the prayer this evening. Tell us your name, how old you are, and where are you reading from tonight? Hi, my name is Kenyon, and I'm reading from Revelation 21, verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for former things have passed away. All right, well, thank you very much. And... Uh, Christy, you're going to be praying for us. All right, let's bow our heads as we pray. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus please bless Pastor Doug as he preaches today. And please bless the people that are watching and that are here. And thank you for giving us this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You may all be seated. I'd like to invite Pastor Doug to come forward for our Bible questions. And thank you to those of you who are watching for all of the good Bible questions you've sent in. Amen. We haven't been able to answer all of them here at the program, but I want to just encourage those who did send in programs, our uh, questions rather, to go to the Amazing Facts Kids website there at the forum. That's right. You can post a question and we'll try and answer for it. You that We've had some very interesting questions that I've never heard before, but we don't have time for them all. That's right. Well, let's get right to it. Our first question is a video question this evening. My name is Layton, and I'm nine. And my question is, how long will it take to get to heaven? How long will it take to get to heaven? I think what Layton means is once we begin the journey from earth, how long will it be? Well, some Bible scholars believe it's going to be about seven days because there is a statement in Revelation that tells us there is silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And if a day in prophecy is a year, then about half an hour, well, one hour is 15 days, about half an hour is seven days. And so many believe that after the Lord rescues us from this earth, 
that we make our way back to that city of gold we're talking about tonight, and we're going to get there just in time to celebrate our first Sabbath day there with Jesus in the kingdom. Won't that be wonderful? We had a study guide on that called Journey Through the Stars. That's right. It'll be the most exciting seven days. All right, Pastor Doug, here's the next question. Will the blind people be able to see Jesus when he comes? Well, that's a good question. And uh, I believe that when the Lord comes, that even the deaf will hear that trumpet sound. The blind will be able to see it. I think that everybody's going to be aware when Jesus comes. And, you know, sometimes I get questions like, what about the people that are at the space station? What will they see when Jesus comes? You know, the International Space Station? Or what if they're, what if they're in a space shuttle? And uh, I don't have all those answers, but some very interesting questions that the young people have been asking. All right. Our next question is a video question. Hi, my name is Desiree. I'm 10. I'm asked, my question is, why is God taking so long to come and get us to go to heaven? All right, that's a good question because, well, think about it. Jesus said that he's coming soon. Now, compared to eternity, if you live billions and zillions of years, how long is 2,000 years? That's, that's just nothing. And see, when God said in the beginning to Adam that one of his descendants would come and he would die for the sins of the world, that God would come to earth, well, it was 4,000 years till Jesus came the first time, but he did come, didn't he? Jesus said, I'm coming again. And I think that we're right about the time now. I think this is the generation that's going to see Jesus come. A lot of things are happening. Now, it may seem like a long time, but if you live like angels, unfallen angels that live forever and ever and ever, they look down here on earth, they think, boy, this has been fast. But for us, how many of you have ever been driving with your parents in the car and you keep saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? It's only been one hour and you're going, are we ever going to get there? And it's not that long. And I remember when I was seven years old thinking, I'll never live to be ten. It's forever. When Jesus comes, most people are going to think it was too soon. Pastor Doug, here's the next question somebody sent in. How can I be a good witness to my friends? Oh, that is a very important question. Don't you all want to let your light shine, be a good witness, and win other people to Jesus? The only thing going to heaven is people. You can't take your video games. You can't take your favorite uh, DVD or CD. You can't take money. The only thing going to heaven is people whose hearts are changed. So the most valuable work you can do is reaching hearts of people. You know what you do? Follow Jesus and be a good example. Study your Bible and your lessons about the Bible so that you understand the truth. So when your friends ask you questions, you can help answer their questions. I'm hoping that you have more answers now, having come to the Amazing Adventure program, so you can share your faith and pray for your friends that the Holy Spirit will touch their hearts and win their souls. Pastor Doug, we have another video question that we'd like to play at this time. Um, my name is Justin. I'm 12 years old, and my question is, why did Lucifer's name get changed to Satan? Why did Lucifer's name get changed to Satan? Well, you know, sometimes a person's name is changed in the Bible because their behavior changes. Jacob, his name meant trickster or deceiver. And when he was totally converted and he was, had a new heart, he wrestled with that angel, God gave him a new name, Israel or Israel, which means overcomer. Uh, Jesus gave new, different names to the apostles. And so the new names represent a change of character. Well, Lucifer went from being a good angel, light bearer, to Satan, which means adversary. And he's got a bunch of other names in the Bible, like Beelzebub, the Lord of Flies. And uh, he's the deceiver, the devil, the serpent, because he's cold-blooded. And so that's why his name got changed, because his behavior changed. Well, Pastor Doug, doesn't it say somewhere in the Bible that not only, well, of course, Lucifer's name got changed, but what about us? Will we get a new name when we get to heaven? Jesus says in heaven, two places in Revelation, that we get new names. And uh, how many of you want a new name? You don't like your name? <laughs> Do you know? Hey, we're going to have to, okay, we're going to have to talk to your parents about that, okay? <laughs> 
No, you don't have it bad. Now listen, my last name is Bachelor. I'm a married bachelor. I've been teased all my life about that. My brother's name was Falcon, that's a bird, Bachelor. And people used to call him Turkey and all kinds of things. And so <laughs> some people have really tough names, but you said you knew a man whose name was Sharon. I did, yes. Probably got teased a little bit. I'm sure he did. <laughs> anyway, you'll get a new name. So maybe you and the Lord can pray about what that will be. All right. We've got our last video question then for the series. Hello, my name is Bobo. I'm eight years old. And my question is, why did God create the angels first instead of creating them at the same time as people? That's a good question. Why did he make the angels first? Why not make all of us at the same time? Couldn't God have done that? Well, you know, if you're going to build a hospital, and if that hospital is going to take care of people, first you have to have the doctors and nurses, right? If you're going to make a restaurant, and you want a chef, and you want waiters to serve the tables, you've got to make them before you make the customers. The Bible says that the angels are the ministering spirits of God, and that's in Hebrews chapter 1.14. And so they are ministering spirits that serve the Lord. So God made the angels a long time ago, and they serve Him all through the cosmos, the universe. Well, thank you very thank much. You. Again, as I mentioned earlier, there are more questions on the Amazing Facts Kids website. You can go and get answers. You can post your questions on the forum. I'd like to invite our amazing adventure singers to come forward for the special music, Marching to Zion. Amen. That's what we're doing. The reason for this amazing adventure is because we're on a journey, friends. Amen? Everybody's on the road, and this is the most important journey, most important adventure in the world. I want to welcome again all of our friends that are here at the Richardson Church in Texas, and our friends that are watching from so many places around the world. Many of you sent us pictures of your sites, and we just, we could spend the whole night just showing all the people who are studying the Bible with us. And I want to thank each of you for coming. I want to thank 
those who have been uh, helping produce the program. This has been a real joy and a privilege for me. It's been a dream come true because I think it's so important that while you're young, you make up your mind to give your strength and your best to the Lord. You know, the most amazing adventure is when you find treasure. And that's what our lesson is about. It's a real treasure hunt. We're talking about a kingdom of gold tonight in our study. And uh, have you ever looked for treasure before? Yeah, you know, uh, some of the Spanish conquistadors, they used to go looking for treasure in South America. They had heard rumors that there was a city of gold called El Dorado. And part of the reason for that is people like Francisco Pizarro. He had kidnapped the Inca king, Atalupe, and uh, said that he would not let him free until his people had filled a room that was 22 feet by 18 feet by 7 feet with gold and other rooms with silver. He didn't think they'd do it, but he wanted them to try. They did it. And that was one reason so many of these Spanish conquistadors thought somewhere out there is this city of gold. And many of them died trying to find it. I remember reading about Howard Carter, the famous Egyptologist, who looked for years for the mummy of, uh, well, he didn't look for the mummy, he was looking for the tomb of King Tut. And after years of searching, they finally stood before the door in a seal that had not been broken in 3,500 years. And they cut the seal, punched a hole in this door, and they put a light in there, and people over his shoulder said, can you see anything? And as his eyes got adjusted, he said, oh, everywhere he saw the glint of gold. Wonderful things. He had found one of the most splendid treasures in the last 1,000 years, the tomb of King Tut. And he was one of the poor kings. I've been there to Cairo, Egypt, and seen it. Gold everywhere. And you know, some people sell their souls for gold in this world. It is an interesting metal. It is very precious. Do you know that you can take one ounce of gold and you can hammer it till it's five millionths of an inch thick? It's not very much. One ounce of gold can be hammered so thin it can cover a tennis court. Gold is a very malleable, a very durable substance, very precious. But God tells us that there's something much more precious than gold or rubies. That's truth. And you are much more precious. Because the one who makes gold paid for you. That's Jesus, right? We're going to get into our lesson. We've got a lot to talk about heaven tonight. And uh, I may not even get through all the questions, but we're going to have fun talking about that kingdom of gold. Number one, what is God's kingdom really like? Is it really a golden city? Now, you could spend the rest of your life going around this world looking for gold and treasure, and most people just find misery. But there really is a golden kingdom that God has. You can read about it in the Bible. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared for them a city, a whole city of gold. And again, in Revelation 21, verse 18 and 21, it tells us, the walls of this new Jerusalem were jasper. And the city was, what does it say there? Pure gold. Not just gold. Pure gold, like clear glass. This beautiful city of gold is real, and God wants you to dwell in that city. You can go there. And that's what this amazing adventure is about. We'll talk about the greatest treasure in that city. The street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And there were 12 gates. And these gates of the city were each one a pearl. Now, can you imagine where do pearls come from? Oysters. And so you'd need a pretty big oyster to get a pearl big enough to make a whole gate, don't you think? But God can make that. And some people think that's a fairy tale. It can't be true. You know, pearls are very precious, real pearls. I heard about a man a few years ago, um, Alan Golash in Rhode Island, digging through a basket of antique jewelry, spotted something that he thought was pretty precious, paid $14 for it, took it home, they cleaned it up, and they found out that they had found this beautiful, these Venus pearls, they're like a purple pearl called a quahog, very rare, with gold and diamonds, and someone thought that it was all artificial, it was real. He paid $14, and they found out that it's worth millions. 
because there are these precious, rare, purple-colored pearls. There you have it, right there on your screen. You know, Jesus tells a parable about a merchant who found a pearl of great price. He sells everything he has to get that pearl. It would be nice to get one for $14. But if you found something that was the most valuable treasure, what would you give for it? Would you give your heart for Jesus? He's the greatest treasure of all. You might think, well, Pastor Doug, but how could there really be a city with golden streets and a pearls that big? Do you know, just this last year, uh, scientists from the Harvard-Smithsonian Astrophysics uh, University, they said that in the southern sky, in the uh, constellation Centurius, they found a white dwarf star that had, it's a collapsed sun. And they said they believe the core of that sun is one diamond. One solid diamond that weighs trillions and trillions of tons. And so scientists even believe that there's diamonds out there as big as our moon. So why don't we believe the Bible when God says that he can have a gate made of one pearl? Of course he can. And of course the Lord can have a city of gold. All things are possible with God, and that's what the Bible says. The things that God has prepared for you in 1 Corinthians, you can't even imagine how spectacular it's going to be. Number two, what will happen to all of the sin and evil that's in the earth? Well, we're going to explain this a little bit. You remember when Jesus comes, we read there in 2 Peter chapter 3, the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are in it will be burned up. Then the Lord catches up the saved, the dead in Christ rise, those of us who are alive get glorified bodies, and we begin this journey through the stars back to the kingdom that God has prepared, to those mansions that he's prepared, right? Are we going to need to have a spacesuit to make that trip? No. no. Maybe you think that Jesus is coming in a flying saucer. Are we going to need a spaceship like the Enterprise or something to make that journey? I don't know how the Lord's going to do it, but I believe that he's going to enable us to fly through the stars. Maybe there'll be some force field around us that allows us to breathe. I don't know. But I think we're going to be able to fly right through the stars back to the city of God. Now, when we get there, the Bible tells us that we get like, a, you know, the plan of salvation has been going on just about 6,000 years here on earth. And Revelation 20 says we spend a thousand years living and reigning with the Lord in the kingdom. A thousand years in heaven resting with Jesus from this problem of sin. But at the end of that 1,000 years, God is then going to transport that city. You know, we got a space station right now. Shouldn't it be a problem to believe that God can make a space city? That space city is going to go through space and it's going to come back down to this earth at the end of the 1,000 years. When the city comes down, the Lord is going to call all the wicked who have ever lived will come forth from their graves. That's the time, and after the new Jerusalem touches down, there's the great judgment. The wicked are all judged. Satan is there. Satan tries to get all the wicked to attack the city of God. And the Bible says, God rains fire down out of heaven upon the wicked. It forms a lake of fire. Everyone is punished according to what they deserve. But it's not going to hurt those that are in the city. You can read in Malachi chapter 4, verse 1, All who do wickedly will be stubble. The day that's coming will burn them up. Well, how come it's not going to hurt us who are in the city of God when all around the world there's this lake of fire? Well, God builds his city pretty strong. It says the walls of the New Jerusalem are 144 cubits. I think that means 144 cubits thick. But you don't have to worry. All right, I'm going to do an illustration here. I, I need a couple of boys for this one. I'll use a girl later. Who Put your hands down if I picked you before. Okay, I just want to be fair to everybody. Young man, I have big, you two right there. You, two of you, yeah. You, since you're sitting together, maybe. You, all right. Look in the chest. One of you look in the chest. See if you can find a lighter there. Okay? And uh, we're going to do a little experiment. And you all pray for me. Oh. Okay. You got a lighter? See it? Go ahead, grab it. Grab the lighter. No, 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 no. Not the light, lighter, right there, the orange thing. There you go. <laughs> okay, now what's your name? And you're? Mikey. Mikey. All right. I, I get that. You just get to grab it. 
Now this is heavy, okay? You got to hold this like that. Don't drop it. Can you hold it? Don't drop it. It's going to ruin everything. All right. You hold yours the same way. Hold your balloon. Okay. Is that getting heavy? All right. Hold your balloon up there. wonder what's going to happen. All right. Let's see here. Woo! Don't, don't move. Don't move. Hey, brother, we're counting on you. Don't go anywhere. All right. Don't move. Don't move. What's going on here? Do you feel the heat from that? But it's not popping the balloon. Why not? Now I'm going to take that from you before I push my look. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Now let me tell you what we just saw. You can go down now. Thank you very much. Two balloons, both red balloons. Put a match under both balloons. One blew up, one didn't. Why? One, you all know, of course, everyone here knows what a water balloon is. It had something special inside that made it indestructible to the fire. If you've got Jesus, the living water inside of you, you don't have to be afraid of what's going on out there, do you? It won't hurt you. So don't worry about that. You just make sure you've got Jesus and God's spirit in you. Question number three. What does God promise to do then? After all the wicked are destroyed, we then get to watch Jesus make a new heavens and a new earth. It says there in 2 Peter 3, according to his promise, we look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. That city is going to be pure because the first heaven and the first earth is all passed away. And the word heaven there means the atmosphere around the earth. It's going to be fresh new atmosphere, a new world, and you'll get to watch the Lord make it all. Number four, will this golden city be up there in heaven out in the sky or is it going to be back here on earth? The Bible says, remember the words of Jesus, Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek, they will inherit the sky. The earth. So ultimately, God's plan was for Adam and Eve to live here on this beautiful planet. The devil messed things up. Do you think that God is going to let the devil permanently mess up his plans? God's plan was for people to live on a beautiful paradise here on earth. He's going to recreate it and God's going to do what he originally planned to do, except it's going to be even better. God's going to make everything even better than his original plan. Bible tells us, Revelation 21 2, I, John, the apostle said, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. There's a lot of misconceptions out there about what heaven's going to be like. I remember growing up, I went to all these churches where they showed these pictures of fat little naked babies that were on clouds <laughs> playing harps. And, and I thought, you're good, you go to heaven, and you play a harp on a cloud. And I thought, that didn't sound very interesting. That's not what it's going to be like. Heaven is very real, and you're going to be doing real things. And what kind of bodies will we have? Real bodies. When Jesus rose from the dead, he told the disciples, touch me, feel me, I'm not a ghost. Then he ate in front of them so they could see that he was real. You're going to be doing real things in a real world, and it's going to be so spectacular and incredible and marvelous and astounding and amazing that I can't even explain it, but I'm going to try. Number five. What is the most wonderful thing about God's kingdom? Oh, here's where the real treasure is. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God, that means the dwelling place of God, is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Who is going to be in the middle of the city with us? Think about how big the universe is. What's the capital of Texas? Austin. Austin. Very good. Who knows the capital of California? Sacramento. That's where we live. What's the capital of the United States? Washington, D.C. What is the capital of the universe? Just in case you didn't catch that, friends, some young man said New York City. But uh, no, not, 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 
New York's not the capital of nothing. Albany is the capital of New York City. <laughs> but the capital of the universe is heaven. It's where the president of the universe lives. That's God. Think about what the Lord's going to do. Shh, shh. God is going to move the capital of the universe to our world. And we're going to live and reign with him. And listen to this verse, Revelation 22, verse 3. I love this picture. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and they shall see his face. Remember, we heard Moses couldn't even look on the face of God. But when we get our glorified bodies, we will be able to look at the face of God. What could be more precious? What toy at the store? What game? What fun amusement park could be more precious than being in the presence of the one who made the universe? That ought to make your heart beat a little bit faster. And you know what else? You'll have special powers then too. You can read in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Have you ever sung that song, Rock of Ages? We will soar to worlds unknown. You'll be able to fly. Won't that be? And you won't need a 747 to do it. That's one of the things that really excites me about heaven, to be able to fly to other worlds and be an ambassador for God. It's real. Okay, I need to illustrate something here. Um, Hoop, if you had a chance, yeah, let's put your, put your hands down if you've already had a chance. You haven't had a chance yet, young? All right, come on up here for a second. Have you had a chance? Yeah, no, yes? Have you been up here, no? All right, come on up. Done? Look in there. See if you can find, what's your name? Oksana. Oksana. See if you can find some worms in that chest here. I want to tell you all a story. Okay. Hey, come on over here with your worms here. Once upon a time, there was a fox, and he wanted to eat this bird, but uh, the bird was too fast for him. And one day when the bird was out pecking around looking for worms, the fox said, I know the best place in the world to find the fattest worms. He said, I'll make you a deal. He said, if you give me one of your feathers, they're beautiful feathers. you got the most beautiful feathers. If I could have one of them, I think that'd be great. So I'll give you a fat worm. And the bird thought, oh, I got lots of feathers and they are kind of beautiful. He said, uh, all right, I'll give you one feather. Sorry, right, you go ahead, take one feather out. Give it to the fox. All right, give me a worm. One worm. He, he would wait, the fox had to put the worm down because you don't want to get too close. And so then the bird would, and he'd swallow it. I'm not going to do that. And then he said, boy, that was really good. Next day, he's hopping around pecking. Fox says, you know, that feather looks so good in my house. So I sure wish I could have another one. I got a really big worm. And he said, yeah, I got lots of feathers here. And so he said, all right, yeah, you can take one more. And he said, got another worm. You can take two. It's okay. Give me two worms. Let's just be fair. <laughs> all right. And so then he <laughs> ate his, his gummy worms. And this happened all summer long. And he kept trading worms. Give me a handful of worms. Watch those feathers. They're dangerous. Okay. And you go ahead. You take, you take, uh, take, take a few more feathers. Just leave me at least one. Leave me at least one feather. There you go. Boy, you didn't leave me very much. Thank you very much. And now you know what happened. Finally, it got cold, and it was time for that bird to fly south with the rest of the family. But he hadn't noticed one feather at a time, he'd been losing his wings. And when everyone flew away, pretty soon the fox came out, and the bird tried to run from the fox, and the fox got him because he couldn't fly anymore. He traded his wings for worms. And you know, the devil does that with kids all the time. You know what these worms are? These are the temptations and the sins that he says are going to bring us so much happiness. 
and we trade our, our glorified abilities that God gives us and our gifts. And tell you what, you can, you can take those feathers there and uh, let me see here. Share a couple with him. That's all I got. <laughs> and just don't play with them during the program. You understand the point of that. The devil is trying to take the kingdom of heaven from you one worm at a time. You can be able to fly there and mount up with wings like eagles. Number six, what other wonderful things does God have planned for us in his new kingdom? The Bible says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, it is a new heaven and a new earth, and there's no more sea. There's no more briny salt water. It's all fresh water that will be separating people. The desert will blossom as the rose. There's no more curse in the land. All right, I can use a girl now. Let me see here. If you haven't had a chance yet. Chance? Haven't had a chance? Okay, I see some back here that, uh, okay, you can come. Now, I couldn't put these in the box, I'm sorry, because I'm afraid that with the light and everything in there, they'd wilt. All right. Are those pretty roses? Yeah. Do they look like real roses? Yeah. Do they smell like real roses? Yeah. Yeah. Is there something unusual about those roses? Well, I know that's not normally how you give roses away, but uh, let's keep looking. What's the normal problem you got with the roses? Thorns. These roses have no thorns on them. You hold that bottle real tight. Let me see if I can get one of those out of here. These are real roses. Ooh, I don't want to hurt it. Look at that. They have no thorns on them. Why are there thorns on most roses? Because of sin. Will there be thorns on the roses in heaven? No. no. Everything's going to be beautiful there. You go to the most deserted place in heaven, it's going to look like a rose garden. It'll be beautiful, and there's no thorns, and the mosquitoes are going to be cute in heaven. And they won't blight. They'll just eat nectar like butterflies. All right, I tell you what. You get this one if you take the other two over to Mrs. Bachelor, okay? Don't seem you got to get all the mileage out of flowers whenever you can if you're married. Let's keep going here. You know, if you bring a pretty girl up and give her a rose, you better give two to your wife. Just in case you didn't know that. A little tip for you kids. You don't get your wedding advice from Pastor Bachelor. <laughs> all right, Revelation 22. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river, there's something very special that used to be in the Garden of Eden. God's protected it. It's the tree of life, which bore 12 different kinds of fruit, Yielding its fruit every month. Let me see, who's good at math? Twelve kinds of fruit, twelve times a year is how much? 144. 144 different kinds of fruit on one tree. Do you want to hear something? Any of you ever been to Baskin Robbins? Baskin Robbins has a number. What's that number? 31. You know how I know that? I worked at Baskin Robbins when I was 14. That sounds like a fun job, doesn't it? And the man who ran the place, he told me, he said, you can eat all the ice cream you want. They have to have 31 flavors of ice cream at all times, but Baskin Robbins actually has hundreds of, if not thousands of different flavors they've developed. But they've got to have at least 31 in the store at one time. Can you imagine what that tree will be like? You won't have to go from aisle to aisle to find out what to eat like at the supermarket. You just go to that tree 144 different kinds of fruit a year and because it's planted by the river of God running through it, fresh fruit all the time. You can't even imagine how wonderful it's going to be. And the Bible says the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. The streets of the city will be full of boys and girls playing in the streets. Will you have to have alarms in your houses for burglars? Will there be, not in heaven, you won't. Who are you going to keep out? Matter of fact, you won't even need windows on your windows because the climate's always going to be beautiful, right? And you're, never going to have, you're not going to have to have air conditioning. Will there be any cemeteries? No police stations? Will there be any hospitals? Not in heaven. Everything's going to be beautiful. 
Will the animals hurt each other? No. Isaiah 65, verse 25. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. And it says, a little child shall lead them. Now right now, if a mother saw her little child wander through the bars of a lion's cage or a bear's cage, she'd scream. Right? Up in the mountains where we live, we've got bears. Saw some just a few weeks ago. And when our kids were growing up and they were little, I really had to make sure they were out there with the dog because a bear could pick them up and run off with them. Will we have to worry about that in heaven? It says a little child will lead them and a bear and a cow will graze together. Bears will be grazing. Lions will be eating straw. And a nursing child will play by the hole of a cobra or some venomous snake and it won't hurt. They don't bite. They don't have venom. There's no poison. There's nothing that will hurt. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Everything there is going to be back like the Garden of Eden again. It's going to all be good, good, very good. You know, uh, how many of you have heard the story of Little Tyke? Little Tyke was a lion who was uh, kind of rescued from a zoo because the mother rejected it when it was a baby cub. It was a lioness. And uh, George and Margaret Westbow had a place called the Hidden Valley Ranch in Seattle. And they adopted this little lion cub and tried to nurse it and raise it up. But they noticed right away it was a very unusual cub. It had absolutely no interest in all in eating any kind of meat. And they used to think it's not going to be healthy. And they tried to force little tyke to eat meat. Or they tried to even pour a little blood in its milk so it would get used to it. And it would turn up its nose. you got a picture right there. Little tyke, they're offering it meat. See him turning away? If a lion had hands, he'd be holding his nose right now. He couldn't stand meat. There he is with a lamb. It was a vegetarian lion. And you might be thinking, well, he must have been a skinny lion. Got up to about 375 pounds. Never ate meat in its life. That lion was like the lions that they're going to be in heaven. Did God originally intend for us to kill and to eat the animals? Do you think when God brought the animals before Adam and he was naming them, he named them Big Mac? or McNuggets, <laughs> or Buffalo Wings. I mean, is that what he was naming them? The animals were his friends. Not only will the animals not be eating each other, you won't be eating the animals in heaven too, friends. Number seven, what are some of the other blessings of heaven that we read about? Oh, it's so exciting. A lot of good news. It says in James 1, verse 12, we will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those that love Him. You'll get a crown of life that will never be taken away. You don't want to trade your crown for worms, do you? <laughs> we'll be clothed with white robes, and these are not any kind of normal robes. These robes are like flowing, glowing robes of light that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And nobody's going to have any kind of defects in heaven. I think if I were to ask you, each one of you would say, do you got any kind of physical problem or deformity? And some would say, I got a little asthma, I got a little hay fever, I got this mole on my back, I've got you all got this, you know, something we wish was different about our health, or maybe your hearing's not good, or you got glasses on in heaven. Will anybody have any kind of physical problems? No. Everybody will have perfect bodies. The Bible says the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. I think God is going to compensate. You know what that means? That means if you are lacking something in this life, you get extra in the next life. If you had poor eyesight in this life, you get to see like an eagle when you get to heaven. If your hearing wasn't that good in this life, you're going to be able to hear miles away like Superman in heaven. And you know what? I'm going to have a hair on my head that's going to reach all the way down to here <laughs> when I get to heaven. And if your smelling isn't very good now, You'll be able to smell like a basset hound in heaven. Now that could be taken two ways. You know which way I mean it. It says, then the lame, crippled people, will be able to leap. And the dumb, people who can't speak, will be seen. God is going to compensate. You know, sometimes I've gone to rent a car. And when I get to the car dealership, I usually rent an economy or a mid-sized car. And they say, all the cars are gone. But all we got left is the luxury edition. So we're going to upgrade you and they give me an even nicer car than I was supposed to get. 
Well, when we get to heaven, everybody's going to get an upgrade. You get there, though, I promise you, the Lord's going to make you happy. Sometimes I have young people that come to me and they say, oh, Pastor Doug, you know, in heaven, I, I, I want to know, if, if I don't get married before I get to heaven, are we going to be able to get married in heaven? It's almost like they're afraid they won't be happy in heaven if they don't get married first here. And that's a normal desire. I understand that, but I want to promise you something. Nobody, nobody's going to be unhappy in heaven. Everybody's going to be thrilled more than you can imagine with what God has prepared for you. Number eight, what will not be in heaven and in the new earth? Ah, here's some beautiful news. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more sorrow. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more pain. You won't ever have to worry about falling down and skinning your knee or breaking a bone or having an accident because some angel forgot to put his turn signal on and he ran into you. <laughs> you won't have to worry about that heaven because God's spirit and his angels watch over everything that happens. And you'll be able to lay down in the woods and not be afraid to have peace all the time and never worry your future will be secure, not for one day or two days, but you'll know that a million years from now, you have nothing to worry about. Can you imagine what that would be like to know that every day is going to be better than the day before and it's going to keep getting better and better and better all through eternity? The Bible says that it's going to be a place of purity. There shall by no means enter into it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. Everything and everyone in heaven is going to be perfect and pure. That's why we need to ask Jesus now to wash away our sins, to purify our minds, and we need to cooperate with Jesus. The Bible says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's the rest of that beatitude. Would you like to see God face to face? He wants to purify your hearts. How are some ways that you could help Jesus? Well, maybe there's some games you know are not from the Lord you're playing. It could be electronic or otherwise, or music you're listening to, or friends that just are not a good influence. Anything you can do to help you be more like Jesus. You want to keep your eyes on Him because as you run towards Him, you become like Him. He's your goal. That's the key. You keep your eyes on Jesus and you win the race. I heard a story one time about three boys walking home from school. It was a snowy day, and they began to squabble and fight with each other. And there was a man that uh, was passing the boys, and he saw they just needed a little bit of activity. He said, hey, you boys want something to do? He says, why don't you have a race? Oh, yeah, we'll race with each other. Show you who's better. He said, no, this is a different kind of race. He says, I'm going to go stand on the other side of that field. And there was pure snow all across the field. Nobody had stepped on it yet. He said, when I count to three, you start to run. Whoever gets to me first, keep listening, whoever gets to me first with the straightest tracks in the snow wins. So the man went to the other side of the field. He said, on your mark, get set, go. And they took off running. And one of the boys, as he ran, he kept looking at the tracks of his friends, wondered how they were doing. But every time he turned to look at their tracks, he didn't realize he was zigging and zagging. And then the other boy, as he's running, he kept looking over his shoulder at his own tracks. But you know, you can't do that without turning. You ever try and look behind you on a bicycle and ride on a straight line? You can't do it. Every time you look behind you, you'll start to turn. The third boy, you know what he did? He put his eyes on the man. He didn't look behind him. He didn't look at his friends. He fixed his eyes on the man, and he ran straight towards him, and his tracks were straight, and he got there the fastest. You know what the key is to winning the race in life? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, fix your eyes on Jesus. Look at him every day. Talk to him every day. It's like a photographic plate on your soul. You know how a picture gets on a, a, either a digital or any camera? It sees the image and it's imprinted. The more that you keep your eyes on Jesus, you start becoming like him. So anything you're watching, you're watching the wrong kind of programs, Things you're listening to, even the food you eat can affect what you become like. They say you are what you eat. You wouldn't want to be gummy worms, would you? So you fix your eyes on Jesus and you begin to become like him. Number nine, 
Does Jesus want me there, and how can I be ready? Does Jesus want you in that kingdom, friends? He says, I've gone to prepare a place for you. He wants you in that kingdom so much that he paid his whole life for you to be there. You know, in Phoenix, Arizona, they've got this mansion called the McCoon Mansion. And Walker McCoon built this beautiful mansion for his young bride because he loved her so much. It's got a swimming pool. It had a private theater. It had a ballroom. It had a beauty salon. It had uh, tennis courts. It just had everything, 50,000 square feet or something like this. Beautiful mansion. After he built it all, spent $25 million. She said, I don't like it. I don't think I want to live there. She never moved in. Don't you know that must have broken his heart? How do you think Jesus feels when he says, I've gone to prepare a place for you? And we're so busy with the things of the world that we don't want to get ready for his mansion that he's prepared. Don't you want to live in that beautiful mansion that Jesus has prepared? You know, this world is a strange land. There's a devil here. There's a war going on. And the only way to get to the kingdom is to fix our eyes on Jesus, to go on that amazing adventure towards him. I heard about a little collie little collie named Clancy. Family had him since he was born till he was six months old, but then they had to move from Buffalo, New York to Michigan City, Indiana, about 500 miles, and they couldn't take him to their new home, so they left him with some neighbors. But Clancy didn't know the neighbors, and he'd been with his family his whole life, and he missed them desperately. He took off and ran away, first chance he got. Six months later, the family heard scratching at their door in Michigan City, Indiana, and they opened the door, and there was Clancy, a little skinny. His paws were a little worn, but he was so happy when he saw them, and they were so shocked to see Clancy's true story. Went 500 miles, that puppy. They don't know how he did it. He must have had some amazing adventure, but all he could think about was getting back home, and he went inside their house. He went right past them. He saw his favorite rug, and he curled up on the rug, <sighs> took a deep sigh and went to sleep. He had some adventure. Do you want to be with Jesus in his home? He wants you there, but you've got to make a decision to come to him. How many of you would like to say tonight that you want to put Jesus first? Do you want to follow him and trust him and get to that golden kingdom? Matter of fact, I want to have special prayer with you and all of our friends. We've made a lot of friends around the world watching. Let's stand together and I want to have a prayer the Bible says Jesus stands at the door and knocks, and he wants to come in. Would you like for him to come in? Let's all close our eyes, bow our heads, those who are watching. I want to pray with you. Father in heaven, we're so excited when we think about the kingdom of gold that you've prepared, those mansions, all the wonders and the glories of heaven. Lord, we want to be there. Work miracles in the lives of each of these young people here and those who are watching. Help them to know what they can do to lay aside any weights that prevent them from running that race and being in your kingdom. Pour out your spirit in each heart, in each family, and help us be ready for that amazing adventure. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to remain standing. We're going to sing our theme song together one more time. How many of you have caught yourself singing this kind of humming it. A little bit catchy, isn't it? I want to invite our singers up. Those who are watching, let's stand.
Let me hear you all say amen so our friends can hear it around the country. Amen. Are you going to serve Jesus first? Yes. yes. Going to give him your heart. Amen? amen? You two friends who are watching, for more information or to follow up with this series, AmazingFactsKids.org. God bless you. The escalation of terrorism, global instability, crime, violence, and natural disasters indicate our world is plummeting toward its final hour with destiny. Who will survive the final events of Earth's history? Does the Bible give any answers? Pull back the veil of uncertainty. Know the future today. Join us as Amazing Facts presents BibleUniverse.com. This stellar website will guide you to places you've never been before and answer many questions you have about Bible prophecy. Discover what the Bible says about the rapture, the mark of the beast, and Armageddon. Journey into the future and explore the mind and will of God at BibleUniverse.com. Expand your universe today. Hola amigos, me supongo que ustedes saben que Amazing Facts es financiado 100% por su teleaudiencia. Si estos programas han sido de bendición y aliento para ustedes, nos encantaría escuchar de ustedes. De la única manera en que podemos mantenernos en estas estaciones es si ustedes se comunican con nosotros y nos dejan saber. ¿Por qué no enviarnos una nota o visítenos a nuestra página web amazingfacts.org para enviarnos una nota de ánimo y apoyo financiero para mantenernos en el aire? In a world surrounded by darkness, there is a voice that whispers to every young heart, urging them to find the treasure of truth. Those who follow the path will discover eternal riches beyond their wildest dreams. Pastor Doug Batchelor leads your kids on a powerful, soul-winning Bible study experience just for them. The 10-part series is filled with incredible Bible stories, exciting spiritual discoveries, and heartwarming music, all designed to help your kids stand with Christ for eternity. The most valuable thing that God ever gave to this world was His Word. Join us for an amazing adventure, a journey for life with Jesus. Order yours now. Take the journey. If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at amazingfacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents. One location, so many possibilities. Amazingfacts.org.